I'm looking forward to the next presentation because I see that Susan Madden's joined the other team and she's now uh, with the Murray Darling Basin. After coming out of the Macquarie River Food and Fibre, and her main job was to pick on the Murray Darling Basin, and now she is one. So this this could be this could be very interesting. So please welcome Susan Madden. Thanks for that introduction, Mike, and thank you also for the opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, Mike's given you a little bit of, of my background. Um, I'm another panellist hailing from northwest New South Wales originally, um, but for the last 10 years I've been living in Dubbo, um, have an agricultural economics background and have had roles in, in policy and consulting. But my most recent role was as an irrigation advocate for a group called Macquarie River Food and Fibre. Um, and I guess a little bit like Jen Medway said at the start as well, um, perhaps I've gone from one of those people who used to take problems to a minister's door to now somebody who, having been appointed a member of the authority in March, um, now has to take some personal accountability to finding um, solutions to some of those issues. So, um, you know, and I think that appointment in March was possibly, you know, obviously a very exciting um, opportunity for me, but it's obviously a very daunting one as well. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority is essentially charged with the integrated management of the basin's resources. So I guess today if I take the opportunity to have a chat to you about the resource itself, the, the competing uses and values and people that are relying on it, um, and you will see the challenges that that present if you're not already very familiar with those. Uh, and therefore some of the, some of the management approaches, um, be those policy and legislative or infrastructure and operations um, to address those challenges. So if you take a look at the basin, who lives in it? Um, I don't know how many of you, quite a few of you, no doubt, uh, here in Albury today in particular. So we've got 14% uh, of the land mass of Australia covering four states and a territory, which presents its own set of challenges. Um, $18.6 billion worth of agricultural production. We've got close to 50% of the country's irrigation farms within the basin. Uh, it, there's two million of us living within it, and we, uh, the resources provide water for another million on top of that. Uh, and then obviously, you know, really important cultural, both Aboriginal and European heritage values, as well as environmental values. And this slide gives a bit of an insight to some of that as well. We've got, uh, you know, over 40 Aboriginal nations um, within the basin, 30,000 wetlands, uh, you know, many numbers of endangered species. So that gives you a little bit of an insight into the competing uses and, and, and the, um, the values associated with the resource. Now, the resource itself, um, this slide gives you a little bit of an indication about that as well. Um, the Murray-Darling Basin, so if we're talking about flows and what eventually sort of comes out the other end, probably uh, I think it's 83% of that is originates from the, the Murray system uh, and another 17% from the Darling. Another way of looking at the, um, the variability uh, of the system. The darker blue is the Murray and the lighter blue being the Darling. And so they're not always aligned, they're highly variable. Um, you know, and, and that's something that we're all familiar with and that's been happening and going on for a very long time. Comparing that to some other major river systems in the world to give another idea about the the variability and comparatively low flow as well. So this one's about discharge and it, it's showing that really, you know, the discharge average flow from the, the Murray-Darling um, is really a fraction of some of the other major river systems in the world. Uh, variability, if we look at the ratio of maximum to minimum annual flows, and, and this one if it shows the Murray being 15.5 and, and the Darling at 4,705. So it just also gives an indication of the, the variability within the Murray system and, and the Darling as well that we're looking at. But we're here on the Murray today, so we'll talk a little bit about operations as well. And the Murray-Darling Basin Authority um, has a, a very clear role in, in managing the system along the Murray as well, um, in conjunction with the states. 
So again, just um, talking about some of the competing uses and the, and the objectives of operation of the Murray system. Um, sharing water according to agreements and, and delivering and maximising state water entitlements. Uh, delivering consumptive water, managing peaks, flood mitigation as we're seeing at the moment. And all of this with those other values that are so, so critical to the basin as well. So our um, you know, need to manage for environmental water and supporting local recreation needs uh, as well as cultural heritage and uh, we've also got hydropower and, and the need to sort of managing environmental impacts across the system. So I think what's important to remember is one of the key aspects, obviously I thought I might be able to get through this talk without mentioning the word ba words basin plan, but it's obviously a very fundamental uh, part of the structure underpinning the, uh, the, the work of the authority and the governance structures that are involved in managing the resource going forward. So obviously we'll have state um, water sharing plans which will become water resource plans and compliant with the basin plan. So it's a fairly key thing in terms of how, um, in a way, it provides a framework to give the irrigation industry security of entitlement and a property right, which gives them um, security for investment. And it's essentially a cap and trade approach. So the um, basin plan will set a limit, a sustainable diversion limit. Um, there are allocations and entitlements under that. And ultimately, it's then handed over to industry and the market to ensure that water used for production goes to its highest value use. So, and that's part of a, a key underpinning um, part of the framework is, is tradability of those entitlements. So, um, yeah, the likes of, of Guy and, and researchers within the cotton industry ensure that irrigated agriculture is using water as efficiently as it can. And, and giving that sort of, I guess, government's role in that is providing um, the legislative framework and underpinning the security, and then industry is able to, to maximise the value achieved from the resource in that way. Uh, this slide really just shows that the, the demand uh, as opposed to the inflow pattern of water in the basin. And, you know, that's really our justification for why we have storage is because our demand is at a time when, when the flows are, aren't happening. Uh, and we've just talked about how um, water is managed for, for irrigated and consumptive purposes. But um, another, I guess, you know, really emerging customer that we have to now to, to um, service is an environmental water holder and they might be state or our Commonwealth environmental water holder. Uh, we're seeing, again, uh, entitlement for or water recovered for environmental purposes has been recovered through the market so that entitlement holders are able to receive a market price for water that goes back to the environment. Uh, that might have also been done, and there's a, a preference that that be done through infrastructure and investment in efficiencies. And again, they've been run through market-based processes so that it's the proponents, it's industry that are coming to government with how best to save water. And then, you know, that water that is then managed by the government for environmental uses, which uh, as, as a public good and as it should be. But that environmental water holder or those environmental water holders as we will need to have the same pressure on them for efficient use of that resource as, as the irrigation industry and as we're all competing for a limited resource. So that's requiring um, some new ways of doing things. One of the perhaps controversial aspects of, of the plan then is how to manage around constraints and constraints are, you know, it's really development, it's really people who, are, you know, communities have lived and developed on the floodplain. So it could be things like crossings or bridges or low-lying um, private land and, and roads. So this is a challenge for how uh, environmental water users who are trying to restore natural regimes to some flooding practices and now we've got challenges of, of development along the floodplain. So there's uh, a process around that and that's um, heavily, heavily involved with um, the states are involved in that as well to help um, manage a process for dealing with some of the changes that might be required on, on private land and to public infrastructure. There's also some changes that will need to be thought about to policy and to um, water management rules to allow for environmental water that has been recovered to actually get to its intended 
purposes and this will also create some challenges and will require strong collaboration with um, state governments as well. So there's terms that's called um, things like shepherding and, and piggybacking and these are about how do, particularly in areas that had unregulated plans and uh, rules that allowed irrigators to access when a flow reached a certain height, but now that's an environmental uh, entitlement being delivered to a site. So it's trying to you know, manage it so that that water can actually get where it was intended to on, the, uh, on a floodplain without being pumped out along the way. And so that will re require some, some changes to existing um, policy and practice, which will create some challenges going forward. Uh, I guess this slide just gives an example of how some floodplain and low-lying areas that used to, under natural conditions, would have received flooding more frequently now don't receive that very often. So I guess as a delivery um, body, the MDBA is also changing some of its structures and putting in new regulators and things to help uh, meet uh, environmental needs. So if we look at this example on the, the Chowla floodplain, we've got a natural area that would have flooded at a volume of around 70,000 megalitres uh, through the regulator and able, being able to, to lift the um, water level that site's now able to be flooded at about half that volume. And they're the kind of things that the environmental water holders will need to think about going forward. Another uh, popular thing these days is fishways and fish ladders to allow for passage um, along the river system. It, it's not all about the volume of water, but there are other constraints within the system. Uh, and you know, coming from the Macquarie Valley, we've got the a new tower in Burundong Dam uh, called a cold water pollution uh, mechanism, which essentially the fish, uh, the water used to be released from the bottom of the dam, which was very cold and had an impact on native fish you know, up to 80 kilometres downstream. So this new floating curtain essentially shandies the water from different levels of the dam, raising the temperature and mitigating that impact to, to fish along the way. There are a whole range of new innovations that we will need to see going forward. Some of those will involve um, partnerships with, with private landholders. Some of the things we're looking at as part of the Northern Basin Review are to consider can arrangements be made with landholders um, on private land to use private um, storages to help with environmental water delivery. So lots of new things that will be need, need to be thought about as we're moving forward. Uh, just being here today in, in Albury and the current conditions, you know, I think that we we were looking at, you know, when I started at the authority in, in March, some of the early briefings we were getting were uh, around how we were going to manage the low allocations that were likely to be announced on the 1st of July, uh, how we were going to deal with potentially not being able to meet critical human needs if we had a repeat of the worst um, drought on history. Uh, I'm now down here trying to avoid questions about why we're releasing or haven't been releasing water to do with um, flood mitigation. So, yeah, some of the many challenges we're facing. Um, you know, I think living in rural and regional New South Wales, it's the day that we're not talking about water and competing over water use will be a bigger issue because that's when we won't have viable, viable communities. So, you know, I think necessity is the mother of all innovation. Um, the demands that we have on our resources in Australia will continue to dri uh, drive new approaches and technologies in this area. So look forward to all of you being part of that discussion and uh, like all good agencies, we're on all forms of social media these days, so please feel free to join the conversation and, and we'll be here this afternoon. So thank you very much. Um, wasn't that good? Susan's a graduate of the Peter Cullen Trust. She's a fellow. And Peter Cullen was this wonderful old scientist. Did anybody remember him? Large man. And uh, he, um, he was really about riverine uh, ecology and environment. And, and his big thing was, how do you communicate? And he used to use the word synthesise. How do you synthesise the science so that people can understand it and people can, uh, can align and, and feel part of that? And I think this what you saw then is a, a really good presentation from somebody well trained around uh, you know, the big picture of water in the basin and what it all means to us. So any questions for, for Susan? That was 
I'm really proud of that one, actually. I, I was one of the original trustees of the Peter Cullen Trust. Yes, down the back. Hi, Annalise McGall from Local Land Services in Goulburn. Um, is quality of water part of the plan? Like Sydney Water make a, put a big investment into fixing erosion and looking at erosion works in the upper parts of the catchment to help with the water quality for Sydney Water. Is that part of the Murray-Darling Basin plan at all? It is, yeah. There is actually a whole section on, on um, quality. I think what often happens is the, the headline numbers and, and volumes become a, a detraction or, or the media focus. Um, but yeah, there certainly is a consideration of, of water quality and there's a whole range of intergovernmental groups who, who deal with that side of it. So is that sort of, um, is there any funding allocations or working with other peoples? Because we often feel like Western waters get really left out when we're right next door to the Sydney water catchment and they get like we have, oh, I think, half a million dollars to spend this year just on fixing erosion in the area, whereas Western Waters have little to no money. Yeah, there is funding. I can get you some more information about it because it certainly isn't... It is a smaller component of the overall. And I, I know, um, you know, Sydney Catchment Authority, which has now been merged into Water New South Wales, actually had a mandate for protection of riparian areas. And, um, and that was something that rural water didn't and, and were quite nervous about... Uh, the, going into that merger. Um, but yeah, it, there is a component of it in the Basin Plan. I can get you some more information around funding commitments to that. It is a bit Vegemite, isn't it? You know, you've got an enormous area with one scoop of Vegemite, uh, whereas the Sydney Water's got a very small area and a lot of money, and, you know, mm. it, it's a different sum. It's a very difficult to solve that problem on, on the scale of the Basin, which is the damned big thing. Anybody else? Sean, you got anybody? Sal, you got anybody? Here we go. I'll um, I'm Amity Dunstan. I'm currently a delegate on the Victorian Rural Drainage Strategy, um, which we're writing a strategy to address drainage because it's sort of fallen off the Victorian radar, whether it's local government or CMAs. Now, I live in the Wimmera. I'm, I'm not an irrigator. Everyone's background, uh, the Wimmera irrigators sold their entitlements to the Murray-Darling Basin yeah. uh, for, for, uh, for funding because we're <coughs> actually an aquifer based with rather than surface, we're underground water. Uh, this is terribly undiculate. What I'm curious about, though, as a grain grower, knowing that there's no scope anymore to be an irrigator using the irrigation infrastructure, is there any scope that we could collect our water that, on our properties and then reticulate that back onto our crops as for opportunity rainfall harvesting under the plan? It's a big question. <laughs> I'm trying to do I'm a James thing. I'm, I'd You're love to be an irrigator. Click that one. <laughs> um, I've, no, never, I've yeah. never seen it like that. That's is pretty there good. Is there scope to <laughs> harvest water under the plan? Mm -hmm. It's so, so harvest on private land. Yes. Mm. So I know in New South Wales we've got a rain, you know, on property runoff allowance. Uh, I'm not sure Victorian legislation. I would assume that. So does that go through water boards then? If There's an allowance that is your right, is a harvestable right on, on a uh, Could you please contact um, Grampians who are in Mallee Water and, and tell them that... Well, this is what I'm saying. I'd have to check the Victorian legislation, but um, certainly in New South Wales, there's an allowance on your own property that you, you can... Excellent. Collect, Thank, thanks, yeah. Susan. Hello. Hello. Hello, Ty Maidman, a dairy farm from South Australia. Um, can you give me any fact, or hopefully it's fiction, um, maybe a rumour, that overseas investors... Uh, buying up rights for water in South Australia and which is more or less taking, oh sorry not South Australia, Australia I should say, um, which is more or less taking that volume of water away from food producers? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges with moving to that cap and trade model where you're moving to a market based approach, it's a property right and people are able to sell um, water to whoever they like and those people can, you know, don't necessarily have to irrigate uh, in it. I can't tell you figures about um, what volume is owned by who, but there's certainly been a call that, you know, there's a, a greater transparency and record of foreign investment in, in water entitlement. So it actually is, it is happening? Like it, uh, it, it is could happen to a degree, yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Is, is the government doing anything there? I mean, that seems crazy, the fact that, you know, where this food producing bowl or cash cow of Australia, but yet we're happy to sell our water off at the highest possible bidder when you know everyone wants this clean green food, yeah, um, yeah. The question is: Is the government 
putting a hold on that? Is it capped at a certain amount? Or is it just whoever, whoever's got the money is going to buy the water? It, I don't believe it's that water is capped at a certain amount at the moment, although there is pressure to do so. Um, so it's certainly on the government's radar. Sean, you got one? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, in, in Guy Roth's very amusing talk, he showed us a photo of uh, a channel irrigation system that dates back to Roman times, <laughs> and they're still being used. And if we're talking about innovation here over the next few days, what sort of a priority is it to replace Roman technology in our <laughs> irrigation industry? So one of the things that came about with the Water Act and the Basin Plan was a very large commitment, $12 or $13 billion from the federal government, and a lot of that has been invested into modernising irrigation systems. Um, that's occurred both on private farm and on delivery schemes as well, so the likes of your Murrumbidgee irrigation to a private irrigation scheme in the, in the Macquarie Valley. So. Uh, Ultimately, yes, there is government investment in that, but again, being a market and you know market driving um, forces to the highest value use, then you would assume that there's some self-correcting in that as well. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to wrap up now, but that that was a really interesting discussion. I think I think um, you know we talked about uh, we talked about technology before, but now we're talking about real issues and. You can relate these two things. How, how do we make technology and how do we make all these new modern things um, solve the problems that these people are trying to solve? And, and you saw them actively doing that. You know, the fizzy trace in, in pork is actually quite fascinating and, and world class. And, and they're doing the same in eggs. Um, the eggs can be um, genomically tested and you can tell whether they're free range or whatever. The, the, the stuff is pretty interesting. So there's some technologies out there that are pretty exciting. The question for us is, what's the next steps? How do we take, where can we go with this and how can we as a group in agriculture take advantage of this? Please take a break for afternoon tea and we'll be back at a quarter past four.